Hello and welcome to the third lesson on photosynthesis. So this lesson is B8.2. We're going to be looking at the rate of photosynthesis, so how fast it happens. Today's lesson, we're going to look at some of the limiting factors of photosynthesis. We're going to be able to draw and describe graphs showing the rate of photosynthesis and hopefully you'll be able to explain why the rate of photosynthesis varies depending on the time of day or even the time of year. And if you are doing the higher content or you're doing triple science, you're going to need to look at and understand the inverse square law for light intensity. If you need to pause the video at any time, feel free to do so. So starting off, we're going to do a few recall questions on the previous lessons. I'm going to show you three questions that I would like you to answer. So there are our questions. Pause the video now and then we will go through them. Welcome back. OK, so for our adaptations of a leaf for photosynthesis, We've got six possible answers. So we've got broad leaves. They've got broad leaves so that they can absorb more sunlight. They are thin. This is to make the distance for gaseous diffusion, so that carbon dioxide and oxygen diffusion as small as possible. They've got air spaces inside, again, to make it easier for the diffusion of carbon dioxide and oxygen, either from the atmosphere to the cells for photosynthesis, photosynthesis or going from the cells back out into the atmosphere again. We've got guard cells around our stoma. So this is to control the size of the stoma, whether they're open or closed, to control the rate of gaseous exchange. We've got lots of chloroplast. The chloroplast are there because that is the site of photosynthesis. The more chloroplast we've got, the more chlorophyll that are within it. The chlorophyll absorb the light required for photosynthesis. And finally, we've got the veins containing the xylem and the phloem. The xylem carries our water from the ground into the root, well, from the roots up into through the stem to the leaves through transpiration, giving us the water for photosynthesis. And the phloem carries the glucose and other nutrients either to or away from the cells in the leaf. Now, our word equation for photosynthesis got carbon dioxide plus water goes to glucose and oxygen and again we are remembering to put the word light over our arrow and the balance symbol equation for photosynthesis we've got 6 co2 plus 6 h2o goes to c6 h12o6 plus 6 o2 and again we've got light over it as well So we're now going to look at some of the limiting factors of photosynthesis. So these are things that will speed up or slow down the rate of photosynthesis. They will limit it, meaning photosynthesis can't increase past a certain amount. So first off, we're going to look at light intensity. So how strong or weak the light is. To do this, we're going to draw a graph showing the rate of photosynthesis. So we have a graph. We've got our X and our Y axis. On the Y axis, the one going up, we've got our dependent variable, which is going to be the rate of photosynthesis, how fast it is happening. This is what we are measuring, and it's our dependent variable. On the X axis, we are going to have what we are changing, our independent variable and that is our light intensity now you notice i've not put any units on here we're just using arbitrary units for it at the moment now drawing our graph when light intensity is zero so there's no light photosynthesis is not occurring as light intensity increases the rate of photosynthesis will go up now it won't go up continually it won't just keep going up it will go up in a curve we will eventually will increase and will eventually reach a plateau where we will go flat very sorry that's not completely flat let's draw that again for you so we go up and we plateau very sorry my 
mouse is not working very well. There we go. So light intensity increases, the rate of photosynthesis increases until we get to about this point here. We'll call that point A. So at point A, photosynthesis is happening as fast as is happening at a fast rate. It continues along. Now at this point, no matter how much we increase the light intensity, so at parts either B or C, B and C there, the rate of photosynthesis does not increase. Now this is because we've got the other limiting factors. Either we're not getting enough carbon dioxide or enough water in there potentially, or every single chlorophyll and chloroplast is working at its maximum rate for photosynthesis. It can't make photosynthesis happen any faster. We're absorbing the maximum amount of light we can, so there is going to be no change. So we get this nice curve going up and then it continues along. So moving on, looking at our next one, we're going to look at temperature. Now with temperature again, we're going to draw a graph. We've got rate of photosynthesis on our y-axis and temperature on our x-axis. Now this one slightly different. We don't start at the origin. So when the temperature is zero, we don't have no rate of photosynthesis. Plants are able to photosynthesize synthesize in winter. However, they will do it much slower. So we'll start lower down. Now with this graph, as the temperature increases, so will the rate of photosynthesis until we get to about between 40 and 50 degrees when suddenly the rate of photosynthesis drops off very, very quickly. So we get an increase in the graph as the temperature increases until we get to about 40 to 50 degrees when we get a very, very sharp decrease. We're right on 40 degrees there. So we know where we are. So this is because we've got enzymes controlling the rate of photosynthesis. Enzymes are controlling the chemical reaction. Now, enzymes work better as the temperature increases, just like they do in our body. Enzymes will work in very cold temperatures, but not as fast. Until they get, when they get to about 40 to 50 degrees, they will then become denatured and they will stop working. So we can properly work out our optimum temperature for the rate of photosynthesis is going to be somewhere around here. We don't want to go above 40 degrees because we're going to denature those enzymes, and we don't want to be down at freezing or sort of at 20 degrees, but around about 30 to 40 degrees is going to give us this range here where it's going to work very, very well. Again, overnight, temperatures are much, much cooler, so photosynthesis would struggle to happen even with light. In the day and in the summer, we get warmer weather, the enzymes in the plants can work a lot faster. That's why we see plants growing a lot quicker in the middle of summer than we do in the middle of winter. Next one we're going to look at is the concentration of carbon dioxide. Now let's move on with that. There you go. So we've got the concentration of carbon dioxide. Again, we're going to have our graph, the rate of photosynthesis on the y-axis and the CO2 concentration on the x-axis. Now, when there is no CO2, photosynthesis cannot happen. So again, we're going to start at the origin at zero. As the CO2 concentration increases, so does the rate of photosynthesis. And we get that graph going up. And again, just like the one for light, it plateaus. I'm very sorry, that's not a completely flat line, but you can understand that it should be a flat line. It does plateau. So we get going up and just like our one for light intensity, at A, we've reached our maximum rate of photosynthesis. At B and C, no matter how much we increase the CO2 concentration, we cannot increase the rate of photosynthesis anymore. We have limited it. Now, when we look at all three of these together, we often find that plants have to make allowances. So the CO2 concentration is going to be highest early in the morning. The plants have been respiring, so producing their own carbon dioxide, and they've not been photosynthesizing overnight, so they've not been taking any uh, carbon dioxide in. 
So very early in the morning, we've got very high levels of carbon dioxide. So our carbon dioxide levels will be up here. However, our light intensity early in the morning and our temperature early in the morning are going to be much, much lower. This is because it's not as bright in the morning and it is not as warm in the morning. Throughout the day, as the light intensity increases and the temperature increases, they will both go up, however, the CO2 concentration will decrease as the plant has already been taking some in. So all three of these have to work together to for the rate of photosynthesis to be at a good level. We're going to look at is the amount of chlorophyll within a leaf. So chlorophyll is that green pigment within a leaf that's where photosynthesis happens. It absorbs that sunlight. If we don't have any chlorophyll, we will struggle to photosynthesize. So there are some plants that do not contain chlorophyll in their leaves. They have variegated leaves. They have patterns on them. They sometimes have white parts on them. We've got a picture of one there. So those white parts in the middle of the leaf, photosynthesis won't happen there. Now that plant will do very, very well in the sun. However, if we put it in the shade and a dimly lit area, more of that leaf will turn green to make the most of the available light for photosynthesis. Now, if plants don't have enough chlorophyll, the rate of photosynthesis will decrease. If it decreases so much, the plant will eventually die. Plants need a certain number of uh, minerals to help them. Magnesium is an important one. Magnesium is used for the production of chlorophyll. If a plant has a magnesium deficiency, the leaves won't be green because they cannot make chlorophyll and the plant will die. So if you are just doing the foundation tier for science, this is all you need to know for the rate of photosynthesis. We've got the three graphs and we've also got the amount of chlorophyll. Finally, for those of you doing higher or triple science, we're going to look at the inverse square law. Now, the inverse square law requires us to use a little bit of mathematics, so we need to have an understanding of what it is. Now, for light intensity, the closer a light is to a plant, the bigger the light intensity. As we move the lamp or light further away from the plant, the light intensity decreases. Now this doesn't follow a one for one pattern. So we don't move it back one meter and the light intensity decreases by one. Doesn't happen like that. It follows an inverse square law. So the inverse square law states that the light intensity is proportional. That little sign there is the Greek letter alpha and is a proportional sign to one over the distance squared. Now this can sound quite confusing, so we will have a look at it. So here we've got a setup of an experiment that we could do. We have a lamp, we've got a meter ruler, and we've got a piece of Elodea. So Elodea is pondweed. Uh, Elodea will photosynthesize. You can see there it's giving off bubbles. What you would do is you would count the number of bubbles produced in a minute to work out the rate of photosynthesis. We're looking at the amount of oxygen being produced. The more bubbles that are produced, the faster the rate of photosynthesis. And we've got our lamp here and we've got our meter ruler. What we would do is we would set a distance for this first bit. So if we called it going from here to here, we'll have a distance of 20 centimeters. That's 20 centimetres. And this will give us our initial light intensity. We're not actually going to measure the light intensity, we're just going to see how it's going to change. What we would then get, we would then move the, the lamp or the plant a further distance away. So let's say we then moved it to 40 centimetres. So we've increased it to 40 centimetres. We have doubled the distance. And then if we have doubled the distance, we can look, look at our equation here. So we've got our light intensity here. We've got our proportionality sign. 
and we've got one over our distance. Now we're not using the actual distance we've done, we're going to use how we've changed it. So we've gone from 20 to 40, we have doubled it. We've increased it by a factor of two. So that gives us two. Now we could say, uh, so we could say at this point uh, with the light density, is proportional to half the distance. This would be inversely proportional. As we increase one, the other increases by or decreases by the same amount. It's not the case of this inverse square law. We need to remember to have that squared bit there. We get a little two there. So our light intensity is now proportional to one over two squared or one over four. So as we double the distance, our light intensity decreases by a, is a quarter of what it originally was. So we're not following an inverse law, we're following an inverse square law. As we move, we double the distance, so we increase the distance by two, we decrease the light intensity to a quarter. Now this is slightly tricky thing to get your head around but just remember that squared bit don't forget to square it so as we increase one the other decreases by much much more okay hopefully that has made sense if you do have any questions do come and ask me or any of the other teachers in the department to try and explain it to you in a bit more detail and we can do some more worked examples for you thank you very much for listening please remember to subscribe to the channel as well. Have a good day.